All right, it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend Cynthia Bailey Lee up next. Um, Cynthia Bailey Lee, you can follow along with me in the program to read her bio. It is very handily printed um, at a font size, a half size larger than everybody else's because we recognize her prodigious talent and we want to really reinforce that. She's a lecturer in computer science at Stanford University. Her research focuses on best practices in computer science education and is a leader in promoting inclusiveness in tech. She lives in Palo Alto with her husband and two children where she blogs about Mormon life at By Common Consent. And when I thought about what I wanted to say about Cynthia and how best to introduce her, uh, my friend Amanda Farr said, you should just not try because there's too much to say and at some point you have to pass the microphone over, which is correct, but I'm still going to try. Um, I thought about that phrase from, um, uh, what's his name, Willie Lohman in Death of a Salesman, where he insists you know, that attention must be paid. And I think we all know people like that who really insist, like, please pay attention to me. And Cynthia Bailey Lee is the extreme opposite. Like a lot of Mormon women I know who are incredibly accomplished, uh, they ask that you not pay attention to them, and they just quietly go about engaging in life-altering ideas and works and posts and building communities. So when Cynthia talks, I know that I want to pay attention, whether it's about women in tech or it's about the LGBTQ community or it's a really good restaurant. I understand that if it's coming from Cynthia that we should pay attention because she's always so thoughtful and so, um, so, so well-researched in, in what she brings to the table. And so I feel very lucky to get the opportunity to listen to her today. Please join me in welcoming Cynthia Bailey Lee. Well, I want to thank the panelists um, who were in the session just before me, and um, it was my pleasure and honor to hear from them and people who, um, whose accomplishments and importance in our community that um, I recognize. So I, it's um, a little bit different tone in, um, in my talk, but, um, but I do want to honor the, the importance of the topic, especially now of uh, supporting our LGBT brothers and sisters. So um, I'm going to be talking about girls coding and gospel potentials. And so this is fun to bring together uh, what I do for my day job and, uh, and my Mormon side as well. So, um, so I want to start by characterizing the problem. I'm sure many of you are familiar, you've heard that there is a lack of women in technology. And I think uh, we have it, um, even some exacerbating factors in the Mormon community. So, um, so nationwide, 57% of bachelor's degrees now are earned by women. So we know that women are excelling in school and they're succeeding like never before in higher education. However, only 12% of the computer science bachelor's degrees that are awarded in the United States are awarded to women. Um, in the Valley, 7% of venture capital funding goes to women-owned businesses. There are um, many, many stories of not only kind of systemic sub, um, subtle bias, but um, outright egregious sexual harassment um, going on in the venture capital community. Um, in Utah, so this is the closest we can get to really measuring what's happening in the Mormon community, not that the Mormon community obviously is all in Utah, but um, we know that in Utah, um, it has, depending on which study you look at, either the, the number one or number four largest gender wage gap um, state in the United States is Utah. And um, this has to do with, I think, cultural um, teachings that we give our young women about our expectations for what um, they should do with their careers and with their lives. And we um, know that at BYU, the percentage of undergraduates, um, or the percentage of their undergraduate computer science students who are women is actually um, quite a bit lower even than this already low national figure of 12% 
they're in, from what I understand, kind of the low single digits. So, um, so this is a problem that I care about and that I work very hard to rectify um, in my day job. There was um, a, uh, a big milestone that we hit at Stanford that we've been putting forth a lot of concerted effort uh, even before uh, I arrived at the university to try to bring more balance to our computer science program. And, um, and we can now say that the number one most common major for undergraduate women at Stanford is computer science. So, <laughs> okay, that we're still um, quite a bit below 50% men and women in the major. We sim um, so part of that is simply that so many Stanford students major in computer science were the number one major on campus. So, um, so a lot of just that overall huge um, numbers is what's reflected there, but, um, but we're very proud of that milestone. So, um, so this is something I think about and work on in my day job and that I actually um, do not only as a practitioner of computer science education, but also as a researcher in best practices for how we can make our um, educational work in computer science more equitable and appeal to a broader community, both in terms of gender, but also in terms of race, cultural background, and socioeconomic background. So, um, so I want to talk about why I think this relates especially to Mormondom and why as Mormons we should care about this problem and try to work on this problem. So the opportunity we have is that um, there is such an unmet demand for tech. So Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics estimates that um, United States colleges will only graduate about a third of the computer science bachelor's degrees students that we need to meet the demand for software engineers that exists in industry in this country. So we need to triple the number of people who are graduating with computer science degrees in order to meet the job demand that is out there. Um, the pay in technology is extraordinary. So this matters because of that wage gap statistic that I pointed to in Utah. Our Mormon women don't earn enough money is part of the case that I'm going to make today. So, um, so tech is something that could be very effective in solving that problem. Um, according to the National Statistics, the median starting salary in January 2016 for um, uh, entry level bachelor's degree bearing computer software engineer is 72,000. That number sounds low to me. Um, Stanford students, you know, there's a premium there, but the students I advise, um, none of them are getting offers under six figures right now, and that's for a bachelor's degree. So, um, so this is something that could really, really change the equation on the um, ability of our women to be financially independent. Um, the other reason that Mormon women should be interested in tech as a career is because of the working conditions. The ability to work from home, to have a flexible schedule where you're working part-time um, with consulting or hourly, um, but still be making excellent money. A lot of the problem with part-time jobs in the United States, we're terrible at producing quality, fulfilling, well-paying part-time jobs in the United States, tech is the exception there. There are very good jobs to be had um, in that area. Of course, the perks of um, tech jobs in the Valley that are available in the office are legendary. You have not only the ping pong, but dry cleaning and free food and all that. Um, Maternity leave has been something that's been really in the news. We know that um, Mark Zuckerberg took two months full paternity leave um, with his baby um, who was just born. And, um, and actually, I've seen him out pushing the stroller in the day um, in our neighborhood. He's really using the paternity leave to really push a stroller around. So, um, and, and we've had companies in the Valley recently announcing um, things like unlimited maternity leave. So, um, so these are things that I think could be game changers for, um, for all women, but in particular, uh, Mormon women. So, um, so I want to present my vision for systemic change in the power and independence of Mormon women. Um, Joanna Brooks had a cute way of characterizing what she really saw as kind of priorities for Mormon feminism um, in the coming years, a few years ago, and it was get grades, get laid, and get paid. 
And <laughs> so, uh, and by that she, um, you know, meant go to school, get grades, get a degree, get yourself certified and build up your qualifications and find a way to make money. And uh, we're so conditioned to volunteer our time and to give of ourselves in ways that are not financially remunerative. And so part of the um, reprogramming that we need to do culturally as Mormon women is realizing we deserve to get paid. So um, I, I was trying to think of how um, such a broad vision that I have could be captured in an image for this slide. And so um, this is the one I picked. This is a picture of me on the day I graduated with my PhD in computer science from UC San Diego. And, um, and that is my daughter. And this picture is very important to me symbolically because it shows not only the kind of union of different spheres of my life, being a mother and being a computer scientist and, um, and achieving these things, but, um, but the fact that she's wearing the hat. And I want her to look at me and see someone who is a living example of the aspirations that I have for her and that she can see a role model for a future where every th option is available to her. So this is what I want. I don't want Mormon women to feel like they have to um, choose. This isn't a mommy wars. This is a bringing together of these parts of ourselves that have been fractured by um, a culture, not only Mormon culture, but really just a, um, an entire nationwide culture that does not allow an integration of the different parts of ourselves. And I think um, we can do so much better than that. So, um, uh, you know, there's this debate that happens in Mormon feminist circles often about, you know, what are our, what are our next um, things that we're going to work on? What are the goals? And there are those who are saying, you know, it has to be ordination. We have to have women ordained to the priesthood. That is the number one goal. And not only is the long distance, but the one we need to work to now. And there are other Mormon feminists who say, you know, well, we should work on things like prayers and uh, achieving uh, more voice within the institution, but not ordination. And, um, and I would say, uh, as my contribution to this discussion, we need to work on building up ourselves and our confidence and our independence in our personal lives. And that will give us the strength individually to, uh, to go about the next step. So for me, my first step is I want all Mormon women to feel like they have, um, they have financial independence. And I think that is the game changer from which many important cultural changes can flow. It gives you more power in your marriage, and it gives you more power in your life. So, um, so I just want to point out, though, that this vision that I have isn't um, kind of a radical fantasy. I am currently no more radical than this month's February 2016 Friend magazine. This is a two-page spread about Savannah the engineer. And it's followed up by an activity on the next page where um, you has an explicit joining of um, boys and girls and how there can be overlapping interests. And you can be interested in math, and you can be interested in art, and you can be interested in all these different things as a boy or as a girl, and there's not differentiation there. So um, everyone go home and show your kids the um, Savannah the Engineer. OK, so, um, so if my vision is to have a new generation of computer programmers, Mormon women, feeling empowered to go out and realize their vision in their own lives and help change the world through technology, and um, what are some challenges towards that? So um, Mormon culture does a good job of ed emphasizing education, but not necessarily career paths for women. We talk about going to school, but we don't talk about what you do after school. Um, the other thing is that girls have fewer role models. Um, as we know, you can't be what you can't see. And so it's really important to have a sense of ladder mentoring where people just one step ahead are turning back and helping others. And, um, 
And we have this problem that there's a self-reinforcing cycle where tech culture and the industry cater to the interests of the people who work there and is um, fueled by the innovation coming from their ideas, but it's just coming from one source that is a male source. And the female voice in tech is very missing right now. So, um, so the result is that um, studies show girls drop out of interest in STEM around middle school age. So um, the education studies show that girls and boys are equally proficient and equally interested in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, through about fifth grade. And then um, they just drop off the map. So um, case in point, here is a photo of me. This is me, I was um, active in computer programming in elementary school. I learned to program in um, about third or fourth grade. And this is me in fifth grade winning our science fair project. This is our elementary school science fair. And I went on to also win at the county um, science fair that year. For my project, um, I wrote in the basic programming language. Raise your hand if any of you remember basic. Woo, yeah. All right, so um, I wrote a Monopoly simulator, and then I programmed it to play against itself thousands of times and figure out which properties were the best to buy. So, um, so this is me in fifth grade. I did not program again for almost five years after that. So it was late high school before I started um, coding again. So those are five years that I could have been developing professionally and um, and getting ahead, where um, where it just fell off the map for me because I didn't see anyone who looked like me who was interested in computer science, and it just didn't seem like it was a girl thing to do. So um, so it's not just me. Statistically, this is what happens um, nationwide for girls in STEM. So, um, okay, so I've talked about some of what goes on and, um, and the research. And I have um, come up with a plan to tackle this head on. But um, a little more context for what I've done. Studies show that girls um, in middle school age, and I, you know, I don't know and wouldn't take a position on whether this is nature or it's just socialized um, behavior, but are likely to be powerfully driven by altruism. So, um, and then the career interests that they will express at this age uh, reflect that. So you'll hear girls talking about how they want to be a teacher, they want to be a veterinarian, or they want to you know, rescue um, hurt animals, um, they want to do social work or aid work, they want to be a nurse or a doctor, they want to be in these helping professions. The problem that we have for STEM is that most people in society, and this um, is um, projected and we teach this to our girls subconsciously, do not associate STEM, and in particular do not associate computer science, with helping other people. And in fact, some of the outreach that we do in STEM, um, though well-meaning, exacerbates this problem. So you'll have people come in a little bit like I actually did at the start of this talk and say, hey, you can get rich overnight. Um, come learn how to code and you can found some meaningless startup app that does not contribute to science anyway, but you'll be rich. And this is not a pitch that works for, um, for girls. So um, in the uh, words of we're in the San Francisco Bay Area, so in the words of San Francisco patron saint Harvey Milk, I'm here to recruit you. I love you. Um, I am going to demonstrate for you an activity that I did in our stake. And I will be sorely disappointed if not at least three people coming out of today's event uh, go off and do this activity in your stake. So, um, so I've explained to you some of the specific sociological and psychological factors that contribute to women um, dropping out of tech. And I'll explain to you, as I showed you the activity that we did, how it has been designed to address those specific problems. So um, I want to emphasize that in order to do this activity in your stake, you do not need to know how to code. So if you don't know anything about code and you barely know anything about computers except how to use a web browser, you can still run this activity in your stake. Um, it's, uh, here's all you need. You need activity day girls, and you need young women, and you need a Saturday 10 to 2, I think is the best time to do it. 
So, um, so you just need a church building for that much time and you need some girls to show up. Here's the plan for your day. Young women arrive at 10 a.m. and you teach them what I'm about to teach you. And um, I can't emphasize enough like all the talking points and slides, everything I have available, it's all a package deal. And then you have lunch. And then the activity gay girls arrive after lunch, right? So you have 12 through 18 year old girls coming before lunch and the pitch to them is that they are coming to do a service project where they are going to help the younger girls. And so they come in the morning and they learn what they're going to do. And then after lunch, the younger girls, activity day is eight through 11, will come and the older girls perform a service project for the younger girls. So um, I think uh, you should let them know that it involves coding. When I first approached our stake leadership about doing this in our stake, the stake president was over the moon excited about this idea, totally on board. And the stake young women's president was similarly supportive. But um, some of the ward leadership of young women and activity days said, well, we're not going to tell the girls that it has anything to do with coding because that just doesn't seem like a girl thing to me. And I thought, <laughs> you are the reason we're trying to fix this. Okay, so, um, <laughs> all right, but, um, so it's okay to tell them that it's about coding. But the emphasis is on you are, to the young women, is you are coming for a service project. These adorable, helpless, eight to 11 year old girls need you to come help them learn this important skill of coding. So we're appealing to the altruism motive and we're appealing to um, so an interest that they might have and a need they have to do service projects as part of their young women goals that um, doesn't rely on a pre-existing self-identification as someone who's interested in coding. They'll all be interested in coding by the end, but we have socialized our young women to not self-identify as someone who could be a techie or could be a geek or could be a coder. So any pitch that relies on that self-identification for the interest to show up will fail. So, um, so that's the pitch. And, um, and the whole lesson, both in structure, the idea that we're having the young women come and learn and then pass that knowledge on to the activity girls, and the content of the lesson um, are reinforcing this idea that um, technology is something we can use to provide service to others. So, um, so this part is actually the beginning of the lesson that I give for the morning. So you could all imagine that your 12 to 18 year old young women who've come on a Saturday and it's about 10, 10 in the morning and we're doing this lesson. So, um, so I start about framing this idea that knowledge and talents are part of our divine nature. The divine nature is one of our young women values and um, we know that learning things and having power and powerful knowledge is part of God's identity, our heavenly parents. And so certainly it's a trait that um, they have passed on to us. And um, The thing about having knowledge and talents is that um, they help us serve. So this is a picture of uh, my friend on the right in the um, brown dress is Erin McComber. She is a um, professionally trained opera singer. And she spent years getting a PhD in opera performance and vocal performance and um, now has that talent that she uses to serve others. So she gives a lot of free conference concerts around Christmas time. But, um, but she had to work and she had to um, develop that talent through a lot of concerted effort. But anything that you know how to do allows you to serve others. So we have this girl here um, knows how to perform a basic home repair with spackling. That allows her to serve in a way that someone who doesn't have that knowledge is not able to do. So um, we'll come back to that slide in a second. There's one thing I want to say about it. But um, 
you know, if you're young and the only thing you know how to jump rope do and you feel is your special talent is jump roping, you can use that as a talent to make a new friend, teach someone else how to jump rope. But all these special services that we want to provide rely on having some special talent that we've developed within ourselves. Uh, another thing is you could study for years and have special medical training that will allow you to care for a new infant who needs your very specialized medical training. And, um, and you can serve that infant in a way that other people, no matter how well-intentioned, cannot. But um, again, relies on you having spent a lot of time investing in yourself to build up those talents. So that's the pitch that I would give to the young woman at this point. Um, if I can just pull back and, um, and go um, on the meta level for a moment. These images were carefully selected to include a lot of women and girls and people with different skin tones. That's important. So, um, all right, next example of people who have special knowledge and talents that help them serve are superheroes. So the girls um, of all ages, eight through 18, will recognize this family. And also important that I pick these superheroes and not Spider-Man or Batman or Superman who all have the word man in their name. But um, here we have a variety of people of different ages and genders who have special talents that they have that allow them to serve the community in ways that no one else can. So it's another example of how investing in yourself to build up skills within yourself that no one else has allows you to more effectively serve other people. Of course, I feel like I have a superpower. When I did this on my Saturday in our stake, I put on a cape at this point, actually. I should have brought it today. I don't know why I didn't. Um, and these are some things that I can do because of special talents that I've invested many years of effort into myself to develop. I can make objects fly. I can make it so people can hear each other talking, even if they're on the other side of a wall or on the other side of the world. Um, I can make a car drive and steer itself. I can detect cancer in somebody's body that um, the doctors usually wouldn't be able to see so they can be treated earlier. And I can translate words um, between languages that I actually don't know. And the reason I have that superpower, of course, is that I know how to code. So um, coding is a skill that if you develop it within yourself, you can do things like this, find new ways to serve other people. And it's important that we have everyone's voice and technology to do that because the world doesn't need another app that serves the interests of 21-year-old, single, white, affluent, heterosexual males, um, which is a lot of the apps that are coming out in Silicon Valley right now. Um, we need people who have grounded in who they are as a person different experiences, different backgrounds, and different values that they bring to the technology that they think needs to be developed. And um, I feel like Mormon women and Mormon girls, the coming generation, have the ability to bring the core of who they are and combine the best of this altruism instinct that they have, the best of the honesty and integrity and hard work and pioneer ethic that we have as Mormons to technology and do something very powerful. So, um, We'll um, talk, so this is where I just kind of talk to them about here's why it's awesome to be me, and it really is. I, so I have the best job in the world. I get to teach other people. Um, and this is a special thing that I think is important um, that I appreciate very much about the talent I have, that I think it makes it superior to, say, the talents of the Incredibles family or Batman or Superman. Um, none of them are able to take the power that they have. So Superman cannot take his x-ray vision and um, bestow it on anyone else. So they can use the power that they have to serve the community in ways that no one else can and that has value, but they have no power to share and spread that. Um, by contrast, the superpower that I have that lets me do all those things is something I can share with other people. And, um, and then actually I feel that I have a moral obligation to do so. And, um, and that comes from my moral upbringing as a Mormon, understanding that you don't lose power or decrease power within yourself by sharing power with others. And that power is not a zero-sum game. So um, it's also fun. There's selfishness in there too, not gonna lie. Uh, so I get to do fun things. 
Shout out Pinterest. Okay, so anyway. Um, so, okay. And then um, this is a thing, and I so I've talked about this and presented it before, and I got a little pushback in some um, kind of feminist. <laughs> Did I totally embarrass you? I'm sorry. Um, in some uh, feminist circles about including a slide where I say that having this talent of coding helps me with my most important job, mom, because maybe we want to um, not be reinforcing that message that women kind of have one job or one most important job. And, um, and there's a reason that I have this slide here, and there's a reason why it's um, something that I feel sincere about and not something that I put in sort of to placate some powers that be because I was doing this in my state or something. And that is because um, I think it acknowledges a very real conflict that Mormon women have that um, when we are at that juncture ending an education and looking forward to a career, um, trying to make a decision about our lives. And this was a very real crisis that, um, that I felt. So, um, so I told you that uh, I did this coding and was very successful with it as a child, and then I stepped away for several years. And, um, and it was towards the end of high school that um, I got a job a summer job, and I thought I got it out of necessity, and I felt kind of forced into it by my parents, and they said, you need to get this summer internship doing code again, and, um, and I thought it didn't align with the goals that I had for myself at the time. I thought I was just gonna be a stay-at-home mom. I thought if I had any career at all, it would be in one of these very helping, nurturing fields. And um, so reluctantly, I went into this. I realized almost from the first five minutes of the first day, that there was just such a joy that I felt in being in tech and doing coding and such a feeling of awakened curiosity and excitement in me. That um, that feeling that you have of like falling in love where you just feel at home in a place that um, you haven't felt in a long time. And, um, and instead of being able to enjoy that feeling for very long, I immediately felt um, extremely conflicted and extremely, um, like I was in, very much in a crisis. And um, the reason is that I felt like I had to, at that point, choose between my passion and what I was clearly falling in love with, or staying true to what I felt like I had to do, which was, um, be doing something that helps other people and and be a full-time mother and these kind of things. And, um, and it really occupied quite a lot of my time and energy that first summer that I worked in this internship, worrying about this, this felt that I felt like I was being pulled in two directions to make a choice. And so um, this is something that affects not only Mormon women, I think that affects us very strongly, but um, is also something that affects, I found, um, first-generation students to go to college. Uh, many of the students that I work with at Stanford who are there first in family to go to college have a similar sense of real tug-of-war with their identity where they um, feel like they're maybe being forced to abandon their family and who they were before they went to college and making these kind of decisions. So long story short, I think it's really important to speak to the cultural realities and acknowledge that as Mormon women, we put a lot of emphasis on motherhood, but with the, um, the angle that it does not have to be a choice. And this was the kind, I don't know why it took so long for me to realize that, and I spent that whole summer stressing about it, but, um, and I even went to one of my mentors at this internship and said, well, you know, what should I do and how can I resolve this? And um, I didn't speak specifically to this mentor about this um, conflict with wanting to be a full-time mother, but I did say, well, I feel like I should be um, going to the Peace Corps or doing um, some of these other jobs, and it feels selfish to be a software engineer. And their answer was, well, you could always do stuff that helps people after work. I think there was no concept at the time or no 
message that I was getting from anyone that somehow work could also be helping other people. So, uh, so it took me years to figure that out, and then it was kind of like, now I feel silly. But anyway, so this is an important message. Okay, so how are we doing on time? Perfect. I have just enough time to tell you how to talk to a computer. So I'm going to, this has no gospel content whatsoever, but is just to show you that you can run this activity in your stake because as I said, I am here to recruit you. So, um, so we're going to do just the first part of um, three of the different languages. So I taught the, um, the girls this Saturday three different code um, codes that we use to talk to a computer. So, um, so an important thing to realize about computers is that everything they do is in code. So when you see numbers on a computer, what the computer sees is numbers. When you see words like that are on this slide, the computer sees numbers. When you see colors, the computer sees numbers. Every single thing that is on a computer, the computer thinks is numbers. So, so I always tell kids when I do this with kids, um, you know, what's your favorite subject? And you hear the whole range of, I like science, I like PE, I like math. And, and I say, you're good at all these different subjects. You have talents in all these different things. And in that way, far superior to a computer who has talent in one area, which is the only thing it knows is numbers. But that means that in order to communicate with the co um, computer, we have to translate everything that interests us, all the things we want to do the computer, all the ways we can help other people with the computer, into numbers. So. Um, so I teach them three different codes that translate the things we care about into numbers. And we do this all in one Saturday, all in two hours. And then the young women turn around, and then for the next two hours, they teach it to the activity group. The first code, color code, is, um, is the code for colors, and it's called RGB. So um, RGB is a secret code. It stands for, the RGB stands for red, green, and blue. So. Um, there, every color on the computer actually is three numbers, not one number. And um, it's a number that says um, the first of the three numbers is how much blue there is, and then of course, um, sorry, how much red, how much green, and how much blue there is. And so um, each of these numbers has to be between zero and 255. The reason it's 255, that might seem kind of a random number, but it's not, there's a reason for it. But we won't worry about that now. Um, three numbers, zero means the least of that color, 255 means the most of that color. And from that, we make all the colors in the rainbow. So it's not like what you learned in kindergarten, right, that their primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. In computers, we have red, and green, and blue. It doesn't make sense, but that's how it is. Okay, so, um, and they mix in kind of surprising ways. So if you have, the most red and the most green, you get yellow, which is not what you would get, again, if you were mixing paint colors together, but that's just how it works on a computer. If you mix all the together, so you have the maximum amount of green, 255 green, you have 255 red, you have 255 blue, you end up with white. So with paint, you would get some sort of like brownish thing, but we don't, okay. So, test for you. Which of these colors is produced by the RGB code 255, 50? And everyone's pointing to the guy who will know. No, everyone's going to answer. Discuss with a neighbor nearby you. Oh, we're using teaching styles in this. We are. Go ahead, discuss with a neighbor.
Okay, so who knows? Someone who didn't know anything about RGB before just now, but now feels like you maybe know the answer. Raise your hand and tell me. Yes. Okay, why yellow? Yes, exactly. So it goes RGB. So the 255, 255, those are the R and the G, the red and the green. And so there's the most of those, and then there's hardly any of the blue. And we saw in the picture is if you mix the red and the green, you get yellow. So that's a very pure shade of yellow, but we have the 50 blue component there. So it's this um, slightly off yellow that's there. Perfect. Okay, see, I told you you could do this in your steak, even if you don't know any, um, any code. So, um, so we can take this, and, um, and if we got to our third code, which we won't in this sample lesson, but um, they use these RGB numbers to um, create little web page greeting cards. So here's an example of one that a girl made um, in our Saturday activity. So they make a little greeting card, and it's animated. The ghost guy follows the mouse all around the screen. So this was done with um, a young woman started it, and then when the activity day girls arrive, they get to customize it. So the young women work one-on-one -on -one with the girl and say, you know, um, would you like to change the color of the background or the eye on this face? And then um, they work with the girl to edit the code. So the source code that creates this, um, the JavaScript code that creates this is on the left. And you can see, maybe it's awfully small, um, there are these um, groups of three letters. These are the RGB codes that control um, the different colors on this picture. So what's that? Uh, you probably can. Let's see. Uh, yeah, because it's in the extended window, it won't. Anyway, um, so they actually use these RGB codes for um, so the later part of the lesson. Okay. Um, no, cutting off that part of my thing. Okay. Just close it here. All right. So, um, okay. So we talk about how uh, we use these RGB codes to store computers on the computer. Um, a lot of girls have done this, and your kids probably is a great fine motor skill building activity. Teachers love where you put little things on the pegboard. And this is how a computer stores images that you get only one color. So you get three numbers making one color on each of these pieces of an image, and um, and tiled together all these different things like a mosaic, you end up with a whole picture. And that's how all photos that are represented on your computer are um, stored. So, um, so to a computer, images are just a matrix of pixels like this. And of course, again, each of these colors actually has three numbers that go into it. So, um, so you have a whole bunch of numbers representing all the reds for each of these different pieces of the image and all the greens and all the blues. So, okay, so you learned one computer code today. And um, the next computer code that I teach the girls is how to represent, um, how to represent words. So um, this is a computer code for representing words that is called ASCII. And, um, and it goes like so. So, um, so not only are all the numbers in the computer um, numbers, but actually they're just zeros and ones, of course. So, um, so we have this uh, cheat sheet showing our ASCII codes. So the letter A is represented by 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and, um, and so on. So the black squares are for our zeros, the white squares are for the ones and, um, or white or green, depending on which bar it's on. 
and, um, and they get a little handout of all these. And um, then what I encourage them to do is spell out their name or at least their initials in ASCII um, using these zeros and ones. And of course, um, so this handout is something that was made um, to teach this to, uh, to students. But I looked at that and thought, that kind of looks like strings of beads, right? This is what happens when you bring people with different backgrounds into computer science. And I don't think a lot of guys look at that and see beads. But I look at it and I see beads. So, um, so the idea that I had is to have kids um, make necklaces or bracelets that spell out their names in ASCII code. So they pick two colors, one to correspond to the ones, one to correspond with the zeros. And as part of this Saturday activity, they are not even using the computer. They're making these necklaces and bracelets that spell their names in ASCII. Now, as a teacher, there are a few things that I like about this. One is the sense of um, being able to step away from the computer. So um, many of um, our girls especially, but a lot of people are socialized to fear in some way the computer. Like, oh, you hear people say, my computer hates me, or it's something that you worry about breaking, or it's something that you had some sort of negative experience in your past with. So being able to do computer science, but um, not with a computer device is something that can help people feel attached and feel ownership, even if they've been conditioned by society to feel like there's um, some separation between them and the device. So um, the other reason that I like this is that it's um, hands-on, and they do their own name. So you have a very personal sense of ownership over this thing. And then the other thing is it's an artifact that you can take home. So this is something, you can see I've been wearing it. I wear it every day. and. Um, and I still see young women in our state who are still wearing those from, it was last January, a whole year ago, we did our activity where um, they made this. And I told them, you know, because this is a thing that unfortunately we hear as computer science educators, that part of the reason that girls drop out of interest in um, computer science, especially in middle school, is that the computer lab space at most schools has somehow allowed itself to be um, taken over and um, marked as a male space. So there's a sense that um, this space belongs to the boys and then girls are excluded. And this kind of sociological phenomenon is enforced in various ways through microaggressions um, against girls who try to enter that space. So, um, so I gave them this as a way to fight back. I said, if any boy ever says to you, you know, you don't belong here, or this isn't for you, or it's it's my turn, and then that turn never seems to end, and you're not getting your turn at the computer, you can pull out your bracelet and say, do you know how to speak binary and write your name in binary, and do you have your name spelled out in a binary bracelet? I don't think so. And um, so <laughs> they have a little talisman against the powers of the patriarchy to take with them. <laughs> so um, <laughs> anyway. And now every girl in our stake has one. This is very subversive. Okay, so um, anyway. Uh, so we have worksheets and everything that steps you through really easy. Um, anyone can do it in their stake, and you will give all your girls a special gift, too. So, um, so my closing message is we need help. This is my closing message. This is the last slide of the slide deck that I actually do in my presentation to the girls, but it's also my last slide in the slide deck to you that, um, that I need your help. Um, it's very lonely. We have about 50 uh, faculty, full-time faculty in our department in computer science at Stanford. And um, we have, I think, three or four women. So, um, so I am lonely. I hear from many of my students who graduate and go on to work in tech that they love their jobs, but they're very lonely. Um, that 12% figure for bachelor's degrees award in the United States in computer science, I think, um, overstates. If you go into a lot of workplaces and look around, you know, I visit different tech companies for various reasons as part of my job. And um, you know, I'm not counting every single head, but it kind of it looks a little worse than 12%. And it can be very lonely. So, um, so I would like you to help cure my loneliness by sending me all your daughters and yourselves if you're interested. And, um, and I need your help to run this activity in your stake and to help our next generation of girls feel economically empowered and independent. They can make powerful choices about their spouse, about their family, about their lifestyle, 
when um, they know that um, they have the ability to, to practically make that choice in their life and they are not constrained into choices they're not comfortable with um, simply because of economic realities and, um, and it feels good and women who feel good about themselves are going to be um, more happy themselves that that has value but are also going to um, be much better role models and bring much more joy to those around them. So thank you for your time and attention. website now so um, here I can show you it was actually the web page I was showing you earlier let's see uh, oh the question was are the materials on the website now or do you have to email me or something and they are on the website now um, I can show you the URL is can you see that no you cannot it is. If you go to buy common consent and then the little search box is up here in the corner and you just see um, search for girls code, it'll take you to this and it has um, all the slides are on there and also um, the script for exactly what you can say. So you have no idea what you're talking about. It's okay. Um, all the words that you should say are here in between the slides and then it has um, examples for the coding part and there are links to um, the printables that you need, the little um, secret code um, letters to map the zeros and the ones to the letters of the alphabet that you should print out and hand out. So all the printables, all the materials are there. Any other questions? <laughs> I like that, actually, yeah. The suggestion was to change the um, slide that I talked about that um, to uh, my most important job as being a mom to be my most important job is to be a partner in parenting. That's actually an excellent suggestion. So, there you go. Those are actually my kids. Those are free sunglasses they got from a trip to Google with, um, that's one of my students there with them on the Google campus. And, they're, they have a lot of fun having a techie mom, I think. Other questions? Yeah, I, I have to say I was surprised to see that, um, that in the friend we have promoting that. I do know, though, so I visited BYU. They brought me out um, last year to talk to their computer science department. Um, in part, was just to give a guest lecture. You know, schools always have people come through and do guest research talks. I talked about um, the research that I do and stuff. But... Um, but an explicit reason that they also said they wanted me to um, specifically to come out and visit was to talk to them about how they could improve the climate for women in their department. So this is something that um, every department of computer science in the nation is worrying about or should be worrying about. Um, so it's not um, that only they have a problem. But, um, but I think they recognize that their numbers um, are even more of a problem than a lot of other schools. And I was, uh, I was floored by how seriously they were taking that and how open they were to even some very, you know, so I went into this meeting with, I had kind of, I played McKinsey as consultant in my mind, like, okay, here are all the different, action items that you could do to address this, starting with some 
maybe more minor or easy to implement or even sort of cosmetic things down through radical structural change. And, and I was ready to kind of feel the room and see what I thought they were ready for. And, um, and before I left, I had given them the entire list. I was very surprised by how open they were. Um, and not just a few people in the department, but the entire department leadership in um, how committed they were to working on this. So, um, so someone in the church, and it seems like quite a few people are, are very interested in seeing this change. Well, the state presidency would like me to repeat it often. I think um, I, I've been the limiting factor on this. We've talked about even doing maybe um, several days, kind of summer camp thing or different things. But um, yeah, they've been very, very enthusiastic. Two, sorry. Uh, so after we do the um, we do the lesson about the colors, which is just in the slides, and then we do the bracelets and talk about ASCII, and then after that I lead them through um, and I actually use the Khan Academy lessons in JavaScript, and so um, partly that's the other reason you can absolutely do this even if you don't do coding is that you just get the kids onto Khan Academy and there's a little virtual tutor. Like, do you remember the little paper clip that was in Microsoft Windows? Okay, but it's a much more advanced version of that that's not annoying and works well. And so, um, so it'll jump in and, and um, provide a little bit of the teaching for you, actually a lot of the teaching for you, because it's designed to be for kids, for parents to just put their kids at home on the computer and with no supervision to do these lessons. So, um, so they don't need your supervision. So you can absolutely do this lesson even if you don't know coding. And, um, and it helps just to provide some motivation and excitement of the room. If you're at the front of the room showing on a projector, um, stepping through some of the steps of the lesson, but um, you step through the steps of the lesson yourself at home before, and then, um, and that tutor will be teaching you. And then um, when you do it in the room, you don't have to worry that if they do something wrong and ask you a question, you're not going to be able to answer the question because the system actually answers the question. The little um, character, it's actually, it's Hopper for Grace Hopper, who is our patron saint of women in computer science. You should all go Google Grace Hopper if you don't know who she is. Um, and so the little, it's a little squeaky character, but the name is Hopper. Anyway, so it will pop up and say, it looks like you forgot to put a comma here or something. So you, as the facilitator, don't need to know all that stuff. Uh, no, but that would be an excellent idea. And it's something that industry has certainly noticed the potential of women who um, either are empty nest or empty nest and that the kids are now in kindergarten and feel like they want to start a second career. So you have um, all these boot camps like Hackbright and other things that are focused on retraining women. I think we have a Hackbright graduate in the room. Yeah. Um, so, um, so it's absolutely um, a phenomenon that the industry has noticed that this would be one resource where they could meet some of this unmet demand. It's not something that I've done for women in the church setting, but that's actually a really good idea. Yeah. Um, I Interesting. Well, so the research shows that this, oh, we're sorry, repeat the question. The question is, um, she's running adult women workshops in the Tenderloin, 
and um, and wondering about this research that I quoted saying that girls are motivated by this altruism um, instinct or motive and um, whether that would equally speak to women who are themselves on um, living on the edge of poverty or um, whether they really have the bandwidth to worry about that. And, um, and I would guess no. Um, the research that I've seen about the altruism is specifically speaking to the um, middle school, high school age. So you can certainly imagine why that would be a less complicated um, interest for them because at that point other people are taking care of you, ideally. And so um, certainly for adult women who do spend so much of their time um, being a mom or helping other people or just trying to take care of themselves, I imagine that would not be as powerful. How would I you can run this in your stake. And um, the great thing about this is that you um, you touch a few people and then they touch more and then they go to back to their schools and they show their friends their bracelet and they touch more. So we just need a few people to start this to really start to change a much broader audience. Yeah. Yeah, so the first thing they do, they pair up one-on-one, -on -one, and the first thing they do is um, show the girls how to make a bracelet. And, um, and then they go and teach them. They don't create the whole um, image that I showed. The young women create that in my lesson. And then they teach the girls how to make modifications to it. So they'll um, just, um, in the interest of time, they will say, do you see this line here? This is what makes the circle for the left eye. And so we can change this number and that will make it wider or taller or change the color. So um, they're still learning many of the key concepts, but not quite from a starting from zero, um, making modifications to the existing thing. But, but basically they go through all the same content talking points that the young women do. This age that you can start to your... So um, there's not with JavaScript. The thing about JavaScript is that you have to be able to type because you're typing in the text of the code. And not only you have to be able to type, but you have to be able to hold down a shift key and another key at the same time, which I tried to teach my kids because I'm crazy, <laughs> of course I would, to code you know, when they were like five. And, um, and they had learned a little bit of typing at school. But what I learned is that they couldn't, um, they basically could only do lowercase <laughs> because the extra dexterity required for that is, but that really is the barrier, is the kind of keyboard manipulation skills and not the cognitive skills for um, the level of coding that we showed in this. There are other languages that are drag and drop. So Scratch is one. If you go to scratch.org, it's a language that requires no typing, just clicking with the mouse. And that's designed for kids um, probably, you know, if you're, they're not going to enjoy it if you start them at four, so wait till they're five. And then uh, I was going to say four, but you know, there's like an age where you could force them to do something. But uh, um, so from about five through uh, maybe end of elementary school, and then I would say from about eight through any age, really, this Khan Academy JavaScript is good. And if you're talking about later high school ages, there's um, the MIT App Inventor lets you make Android apps. If you trust your kid with a smartphone and you have enough money to buy your kid a smartphone, that's something you could do. But. Actually, are you the one who runs the resources of how to teach people to code? Okay, so she has the best website ever. You can go up to her and get the URL if you want to teach kids how to code, which is um, a list of all the things that I just mentioned and a bunch of other resources for teaching different age levels, interests, um, how to code. Cynthia Bailey Lee.